Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second SAIS Immunopedia webinar. It's my great pleasure this afternoon in South Africa to introduce Professor Shabir Mardi, who's going to talk to us about COVID-19 vaccine. Shabir Mardi is Professor of Vaccinology at the University of the Witwatersrand. He's co-founder and co-director of the African Leadership in Vaccinology Expertise, he originally qualified at Wits, uh, Wits University as a pediatrician in 1996 and attained his PhD in 2003. He holds the positions of director at the South African Medical Research Council Respiratory and Meningeal Pathogens Research Unit and is a research chair in vaccine preventable diseases of the Department of Science and Technology and the National Research Foundation. He served as a director of the NICD uh, from 2011 to 2017, and is the chair of the National Advisory Group on Immunization in South Africa. He's very extremely well published with over 360 scientific publications on epidemiology, clinical development of pneumococcal vaccines, diarrheal disease, and maternal immunization. He's now turned his expertise in vaccinology to COVID-19, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Shabir to talk to us today about COVID-19 vaccines in South Africa. Welcome. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and th Clive, thanks for the invite. So what I'm going to do, so like I said, I'm going to give you an overview in terms of uh, what the COVID-19 vaccine landscape looks like, uh, but I'm going to focus then on the two vaccines that are currently under clinical evaluation in South Africa. So for this audience, it's probably not necessary go to go into the background in terms of the immunology of uh, viral infections and specifically SARS-CoV-2, but essentially what we're obviously trying to, what we're aspiring to in terms of vaccination is to induce an immune response, which at least matches what is induced by natural exposure to the virus or do better than what is actually uh, achieved through natural exposure to the virus. And I think most of us are familiar in terms of the complexity of the immune response to SARS-CoV-2, including the breadth of immune responses that are observed depending on the severity of illness. So it appears at least in terms of humoral immunity that individuals that are being infected that have mild or asymptomatic illness, they seem to be having lower concentrations of antibody IgG, IgM, IgA that is uh, induced and specifically looking at a spike protein. Uh, but in contrast, when it looks at uh, T-cell immunity, it appears that the T-cell immunity is a bit more predictable and more consistent, uh, irrespective of severity of illness. And that has got implications in terms of the possibility of natural infection inducing immunity that, is, uh, that, that results in memory responses and that is long lasting in terms of protection. So when it comes to vaccine development, uh, all of us have heard in the media over the past uh, few weeks that or past few months that usually it takes anything between five to 20 years from the time of vaccine discovery to the time of licensure of vaccines. And that includes uh, us needing to go through various phases in terms of its, in terms of its development, starting with the preclinical studies, and then going through phase one to phase three studies. And essentially what has happened with COVID-19 or what we're trying to do is condense this five to 20 year time period into a period of between 12 to 18 months. And the only way that is achievable is by really running a number of processes in parallel in terms of this uh, sort of testing algorithm. And what we observe as an example, and that is coming at some cost, so I need to emphasize that. And I'll show you one example of that with the University of Oxford vaccine candidate. So essentially what's happening is to some extent for some of the vaccines, the preclinical testing, at least in terms of the challenge studies in non-human primates, is occurring in parallel to the initial phase one studies, which are your small studies that are really looking at early readout with regard to safety, but more importantly, looking at dosing schedules and different dosages. Uh, then what we're seeing is that the rapid transitioning from phase one into phase two studies. And many of these protocols are sort of adaptive designed, which basically means that based on early results from their earlier experience with a vaccine in this clinical evaluation, you're changing a protocol midway a number of times in some instances uh, as you go into phase two, 
And then some of the studies are also transitioning into phase three, which are obviously the pivotal studies. Now, in between a phase two and a phase three study, which is really designed to look at safety of the vaccine together with efficacy, you've got a phase two B, which allows you to get some sort of a sense in terms of a readout when it comes to efficacy of the vaccines. So currently, uh, the field as it stands as of last week was that there were roughly about 165 vaccines that have been declared to be at different stages in terms of development, the majority of those currently in a preclinical phase. But of those 165, there's already just under 40, 39 vaccines that have now gone into clinical development in terms of phase one, phase two, or phase three studies. And then as of last week, that number of one has now changed to two. So now we've got one, vaccines that, one vaccine that's been licensed in China that is about to be rolled out to the military. And then there's another vaccine that most of you heard about last week, which is uh, Adeno 5, Adeno 26 prime boost uh, strategy that the Russians have licensed. Uh, and that licensure of the Russian vaccine was based on limited evaluation in roughly about uh, just under 100 individuals looking at immunogenicity. And if the same benchmark was used to license the other vaccines right now, we would probably have uh, 20 vaccines at the license rather than two vaccines. And obviously there are huge risks involved in terms of trying to short circuit, uh, shortcut, take shortcuts in terms of the licensure and not just for that specific product. And I think that is a big concern that if something goes wrong with the Russian vaccine as an example, uh, that could have severe repercussions in terms of public confidence when it comes to other vaccines that might be safe and efficacious. Uh, so there's a huge, uh, there are huge potential ramifications from that sort of uh, recklessness to get vaccines licensed with a paucity of proof. Now, the one thing that has enabled the rapid development of vaccines is uh, the use of real novel technologies to develop vaccines. And for many of these technologies, they haven't previously been used to produce a vaccine that's been licensed. And in some instances, there's only a single vaccine that's been licensed using this technology, despite past experiences. So as an example, with, a, with a a gene-based vaccines and nucleic acid-based vaccines, uh, to date, they, that technology has previously been used for the treatment of certain sort of cancers, but it's never been used in terms of vaccine uh, development and design. But the beauty of this is that as they showed with the NIH vaccine, which is now currently being developed by Moderna, is at a time period to actually develop construct is as soon as six weeks to eight weeks after discovery or after identification of the whole genome of the virus and identification of the virulent uh, components of the virus. So it really can accelerate vaccine development. With the viral vector-based vaccines, again, very limited uh, experience. I think most of us are familiar in terms of the viral vector-based vaccines for that were evaluated for HIV, which unfortunately didn't turn out to be that great. And with some concerns in that in South Africa, at least, uh, individuals that received the at 5 vector vaccines ended up having a greater susceptibility to HIV infection, in addition to which there are issues related to attenuated immune responses in people that are seropositive. And that sort of experience has also emerged in terms of an attenuated immune response to the ad 5 vaccine uh, that, was, that has been tried out in China in those that were seropositive. So what a viral vector-based vaccine, the only vaccine that's currently licensed uh, recently are the Ebola vaccines, which are using this sort of viral vector-based technology. Then we've got the more traditional vaccine approaches, which are your virus uh, itself, the inactivated vaccines and the life attenuated vaccines. And obviously examples of those on both ends of the spectrum are your polio vaccines and the more traditional approach, which are your protein-based vaccines. And as you can see from the schema, the majority of vaccines that are currently in development are using the more the traditional approach of the protein-based vaccines. And the viral vector vaccines are also pretty much up there together with the vaccines that are much more novel in terms of the technology that's been used to design it. So with all of these vaccines, what we're trying to do is achieve pretty much the same thing. So I'm not going to go into the detail of this and just perhaps make some comments. So like I said, there are a number of uh, vaccine candidates using looking at the whole virus factor, both in whole virus vaccine, both in terms of life attenuated as well as inactivated vaccines. And obviously what we're trying to achieve here is basically provide the antigens in such a manner which allows for the immune system to mimic an immune response which is very similar to that induced by natural infection. 
but that comes with certain risk. And I think the biggest concern about the inactivated uh, vaccines really uh, culminates from the experience in the 1960s with a formal and inactivated RSV vaccine, which subsequently was shown to induce a Th2 dominant immune response, a lot of non-binding antibody, and consequently, children that received the RSV vaccine ended up developing more severe disease, including fatal RSV illness, after natural infection. So that certainly would be a red flag for anyone that's using this approach uh, in terms of the breadth of antibody that it induces, including a lot of possibly non-binding antibody. Uh, the live attenuated vaccines, I don't think there's too much activity in that field at the moment. And I think that would be a far reach for a vaccine to be licensed using that technology over a narrow period of time because the safety issues around that obviously are much more complex and would require much greater uh, interrogation. The gene-based vaccines, as I mentioned, the beauty is in terms of the speed of the constructs as well as the ability to scale up uh, production. But again, these vaccines, are probably unlikely to become available in low middle income countries uh, in the near future, even if they are found to be successful and to, unless we're able to develop the manufacturing facilities to sort of uh, manufacture these sort of vaccines. Right now, much of the focus in terms of assisting uh, vaccine manufacturers in low middle income countries are geared towards trying to enable them to do vaccine production for the vector based vaccines and the protein based vaccines. So I'm not going to speak too much on the gene-based vaccines. Obviously, what we're doing here is we're basically injecting DNA or RNA material encoding for a specific epitope. And most of these gene-based vaccines are really focused on a spike protein or the RBD, the research binding domain of the spike protein. Uh, the injection of that into those uh, DNA uh, uses the cell machinery to produce a protein. The protein is then released. Uh, and then taken up with the antigen presenting cells to elicit the immune responses. With the gene-based vaccines, based on a Moderna vaccine, it's clear that you need at least two doses of the vaccine for it to be immunogenic. And in fact, after a single dose of vaccine, there's really very little by way of neutralizing antibody. And that neutralizing antibody only materializes after the second dose of the vaccine. Now, where are we in terms of the pipeline? And this basically shows you which studies have now gone into phase two and phase three, or at least in phase three. And the only reason I'm highlighting the yellow one is not because it's my favorite one, but just to remind you that's the vaccine that's currently being evaluated in South Africa. And this is a good example. So this is a download from the WHO a week ago. And what you see of all of the vaccines that are currently in phase three, in fact, most of them are the inactivated vaccines. And like I'm, and all of those are Chinese manufacturers. And like I said, I've got my reservations on that, that sort of approach. Uh, for some of these vaccines, it's looking at a two, most of these vaccines are looking at the two dose schedule space at least two to three weeks apart. But the good example is the University of Oxford, where initially the studies both in the UK as well as South Africa were designed to basically look at the single dose of vaccine. And after the non-human primate study came out, data came out, which I'll share those results with you, together with the phase one study results that were published about three, four weeks ago, it was clearly evident that the single dose of vaccine was not going to cut it for this particular candidate. So they've also gone to a two-dose schedule. Uh, and then we've got a two RNA-based vaccines that are now also going into phase three studies. In addition to that, what we've got is a number of other vaccines, DNA-based vaccines, and at least three protein-based vaccines that are in phase two studies, or at least going into early phase two studies. And we've just started the Novavax phase two study as of yesterday. So I'll touch a little on those two vaccines. So when it comes to the viral vector vaccines, obviously uh, what's really attractive of this sort of option is again, you're using the efficiency of the ability of the host cell to be able to incorporate the virus into the cell, and then you're exploiting the cell to make use of its own machinery to propagate either the virus, which could be replicating, or in this instance of non-replicating virus, you're using the host cell to propagate the gene that's being inserted into these uh, viruses, which uh, basically allow for expression or, or production of the epitope of interest. And in most instances, this is basically the spike protein. There is one construct underway, which is basically looking at the dual approach in that they're looking at incorporating into the vectors, both the spike protein as well as the end protein. And that is an adenovirus uh, vector-based vaccine. 
So this is sort of a schema in terms of just a brief overview of the, the Oxford vaccine as an example. So you take the adenovirus, we've taken a chimp adenovirus where there's very low seropositivity, if any, in humans, and that is genetically engineered for it to be non-replicating. The genetic material of the SARS-CoV-2, which codes for a spike protein, is inserted into this adenovirus. The spike protein is uh, expressed, and at the same time, that is injected. Once injected, obviously, we use our machinery to produce more spike, spike protein, which is presented to the immune system. And this is really the construct that we're looking at. Now, where do we stand in terms of what this is able to do? And this is the non-human primate studies in macaques, where the immune responses after a single dose of vaccine was uh, evaluated. Day minus 28 is day of vaccination. And what we find at for the immune responses basically peaks in terms of ELISA as well as neutralizing antibody roughly at 14 days. Uh, so in red are the vaccinated uh, macaques. And then looking at T-cell immunity by, by way of uh, spike protein stimulated uh, LS, uh, interferon gamma responses measured by Alispot, what we see after single dose, and I think it's important to emphasize this is after single dose, is that there is an immune response. There's a T-cell immune response that uh, endures, but it's not consistent. So in fact, only three of the six macaques really had a meaningful Alispot response after a single dose of vaccine. Now, these experiments were being conducted at a time when the vaccine had already gone into phase one studies in humans. Uh, so looking at the challenge models in these macaques after vaccination, and uh, we're looking at both viral genomic RNA as well as viral subgenomic RNA, which is sort of a putative measure for viral replication. In the bronchial alveolar lavage, the vaccine seems to protect against viral replication as early as day three, uh, day five. So basically what you're seeing in red are the vaccinated macaques and in blue, the controls. So in a bronchial alveolar lavage, very little replicating virus across uh, all time points. But when you go to the nasal, the nasal uh, challenge, you find that a single dose of vaccine essentially is not actually uh, limiting a viral replication in the upper airways. And that could have uh, implications in terms of the ability of this virus to induce herd immunity. But again, to emphasize, this is a single dose of a vaccine. Uh, what subsequently happened is that based on immune responses, and this is looking at immune a phase one study that was conducted in the UK, looking at immune responses, and I just asked you to focus on that part which I've highlighted, uh, the after single dose of vaccine, there certainly is an antibody response, but there's sort of almost more about a four to five fold increase after a booster dose of vaccine. And based on this uh, initial phase one study, it was subsequently decided to actually go for a two dose schedule. And all of the protocols have subsequently been adapted for a two dose uh, schedule. Now, the other important thing is how does this uh, antibody responses, and this is looking at ELISA to the spike protein compared to convalescent sera. Now, when it comes to convalescent sera, one of the issues, as I mentioned, is that there's a diversity in terms of antibody concentration for people that have developed COVID-19 based on the severity of illness. So individuals with more severe disease will have higher antibody concentrations. And this was taken at about day 56. And what we find that antibody concentrations after a booster dose of vaccine is sort of similar in a ballpark in terms of median range compared to convalescent sera. But if you were just to look at those individuals that had high, that had severe disease, the antibody concentrations convalescent sera there would be a bit higher, not a bit higher, so a fair amount higher than the, after a second dose of this uh, particular vaccine candidate, the chump ad hoc uh, vaccine. Uh, when looking at neutralizing antibody, uh, basically this is not, we don't have convalescent sera here, but just looking at immune responses, we find that the second dose of vaccine obviously confers benefit where uh, we got the increase in terms of neutralizing antibodies. So uh, this is looking at dilutional titers, uh, basically indicating lower antibody concentration being required or higher concentrations and greater potency being evident after a booster dose compared to after a single dose. And these are looking at different sort of new uh, assays with different sort of cuts of cutoffs in terms of the IC. So in addition to that, what they also looked at in the studies is uh, 
T cell immune responses measured by early spot responses. And again, when you're looking at a prior, after a single dose, you get this, this T cell immune responses uh, evident by the early spot assay. Uh, after a booster dose, you don't see much happening in terms of uh, an increase in terms of the T cell responses. And that isn't any too much different from the non-human primate studies looking at natural challenge and repeat challenges. We, after repeat challenge, although it does confer protection against uh, reinfection, uh, there isn't actually much change in terms of your T cell uh, immune responses uh, following second exposure to uh, the virus in these uh, non-human primate challenge studies. So in terms of this particular study, as you know, we've been enrolling in South Africa for the past seven weeks. We're just about three quarter way through the enrollment. Uh, the phase two study is also phase two, three studies being done in the UK. They're closing in on completing the enrollment of the 10,000 participants and Brazil are almost reaching the 5,000 mark. They're planning on increasing it to 6,000. And then the US will basically be enrolling up to 30,000 participants in a study that is likely to start in the next month with this jump ad hoc uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So I'm going to now just briefly touch on the protein-based vaccines and specifically the one that we're currently evaluating. The protein-based vaccines, like I mentioned, are either the protein subunit vaccines or the virus-like particles, which is a HPV type of constructs, which have been known to be highly potent. The vaccine that we basically evaluating is a vaccine that's been developed by Novavax. And this vaccine, this uh, sort of technology has been previously used to develop investigational vaccines for uh, Ebola, and more recently, the phase three studies of a seasonal influenza vaccine uh, was published, which showed success using the same technology. In addition to which, this technology has also been used to develop a RSV vaccine that was evaluated in pregnant women, where the results were sort of a mixed bag, and I don't want to go into the reasons for that, but if you just look at the data from South Africa in that RSV vaccine study, the protection in infants against severe RSV hospitalization would have been roughly about 75%. So this particular construct is using a pre-fusion uh, construct of the spike protein, which, which is important in terms of visibility of the RBD to the host uh, immune, to the immune system. So a quick overview of this particular uh, construct in terms of the macaques, a single two doses. And now this is looking at uh, immune responses after two doses of vaccine that are spaced three weeks apart. And the challenge studies, again, are done after two doses of vaccine, unlike the earlier study of Oxford, which was the jump at vaccine, which was a single dose. After two doses, the immune responses with different antibody concentrations. And this particular construct is adjuvanted through matrix M. Uh, you find potent antibody responses much higher than what is observed in the convalescent serum from humans. And both in the, the air, upper airway as well as the lower airway uh, challenge models, intranasal and intratracheal challenge uh, of the virus, you find that in both instances, two doses of vaccine in these macaques are able to protect against viral replication, both in the upper airways as well as the lower airways. And if this is something that materializes in humans, it would be huge in terms of what we really, what is our best hope for it to be early uh, sort of public health value from these vaccines, and that is to induce herd immunity. So the induction of herd immunity obviously is going to be much greater, there'll be a much greater chance in terms of achieving that with a vaccine that is able to actually interrupt transmission of the virus, which means the vaccine needs to impact somehow in terms of infection in the upper airway, either by reducing the amount of viral load that occurs following infection or preventing infection from occurring altogether, which really, really is a tough ask of any vaccine. Looking at the immune responses of this particular vaccine, and I'm just going to get you to focus on that particular group, group C. Uh, the group A is your placebo group, and group C is basically the dosing schedule that now is going into phase two studies. It's, it's a five mic, uh, concentration of spike protein, which is coupled to the matrix MS and adjuvant. Uh, in this study, what we basically observe is that uh, after a single dose of vaccine, we got reasonable antibody responses, and then a multifold, about the eightfold increase uh, in terms of antibody responses after the booster dose. So you can see compared to, and then on right on your left-hand side, is you've got the antibody concentrations from convalescent serum. And those antibody concentrations are significantly higher. So after the five mite dose, we got antibody concentrations in the region of 64,000 compared to about 8,000. So about eightfold higher uh, 
than what is observed in convalescent sera. And there wasn't uh, any difference between the five mic dose and the 25 mic dose, uh, the boost, uh, post booster as well as post primary series, indicating the ability to use a lower antibody concentration. There's some data from the human non human primates, which indicates that you might actually be able to go even lower than the five mic dose. And then a similar sort of experience in terms of the new antibodies. Again, uh, substantial increases after the booster dose. And as you can see, a fourfold higher new antibody concentration compared to post, uh, compared to convalescent sera uh, in the vaccinated individuals. And now looking at the convalescent sera in a bit more detail, uh, the, although it's higher than individuals that had mild or asymptomatic COVID illness, the new antibody concentrations are still lower than what was observed in individuals that had severe COVID illness. Although the number of individuals included here, as you can see from this time, from the number of individuals is relatively few. But it would appear that it's possible that even this construct, which is highly immunogenic, in terms of the new antibody uh, that's uh, induced is actually less than what occurs in individuals that develop severe COVID illness, but way above what occurs in the majority of individuals that are infected, and that is 95% of people that would either be asymptomatic or are mildly symptomatic. What this data also show us is a very strong correlation between a new antibody assay and the ELISA. And this is important in terms of further evaluation of these vaccines, as well as further studies, which aim to try to bring about, establish a correlate of protection. And it's very likely that future vaccine studies after the first two or three vaccines have been licensed, will be licensed based on a correlate of protection that is derived from these initial studies rather than them going through phase three studies. And then another important component in terms of these vaccines is uh, whether it induces a TH1 or TH2 dominant immune response. And I haven't shown you the data for the, for the jump ed vaccine, but it's very similar to this in that most of the vaccines that they, that they have published phase one data up to now are predominantly inducing a TH1 dominant immune response, which is important in terms of cell-mediated immunity, as well as the avoidance of what I mentioned earlier in terms of excessive uh, production of uh, non-functional antibody. Last but not least, the safety profile. So this is limited in terms of this nanoparticle vaccine. Uh, basically, it seems to be reasonably well tolerated, uh, mainly mild. after the second dose of vaccine compared to the first dose of vaccine. That's actually in contrast to the jump ed vaccine where the rectogenicity is actually lower after the second dose compared to after the first dose. So I think with an Novavax vaccine, it sort of checks, uh, ticks, uh, ch checks a number of tick boxes in terms of its potential of being successful to what it aspires to do. And that is both to protect against upper airway as well as lower airway infection. At this point, I will caution against making any sort of comparison between this vaccine or the jump ed vaccine or any other vaccine. One of, some of the issues uh, relate to there hasn't yet been a standardized assay to basically make any sort of meaningful comparisons in terms of the immunogenicity readouts, both for antibody as well as for the new assays. So thanks for your attention. And for those of you that might be interested in either of these vaccine studies as volunteers, those are the details www.vida.co.za, uh, Google, and you can get more information. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Shabir. That was wonderful. Uh, it was a tour de force of what is happening uh, in South Africa today. Um, I have a, a few questions, uh, which I'll, I'll read out to you, and then uh, you can respond to. Um, so the first question is, are the, are the vaccine test findings comparable across the various populations that have been tested? Yeah, I and mean, the short answer to that is that very few of these vaccines have been uh, evaluated in different populations. Uh, so those are the questions. That's one of the reasons why we're wanting to do these studies in South Africa. It's an example, even in the UK and the US, and many of you might have seen this article in Nature. The problem is that there's too few people that are not white that are participating in those studies. So even in those countries where they've done initial studies, they can't talk about differences in terms of immune responses by ethnicity or race, simply because there aren't enough people of color that have been participating in those studies. But that's an important reason why mm. we're needing to do the studies in South Africa and other places. Right, and, and um, another question is, um, 
how likely do you think that we might see human challenge models or human challenge trials, I should say? Yeah, I think extremely unlikely. I don't think anyone is brave enough to go that route until they had a potent, unless they had a potent antiviral that can pretty much uh, guarantee 100% safety against hospitalization and death. So, I mean, I think Stanley Plotkin surprisingly has been advocating for it and many others, but I can't see regulated authorities. I think we'll, it's, we'll get an answer in terms of vaccine efficacy much sooner than we get agreement to go into this human challenge studies. Yeah, yeah. Knowing that um, antibody responses in natural infection wane quite quickly, um, you know, in, in several weeks after infection, what is your expectation that this vaccine will induce long-lived antibody responses? Or maybe we can paraphrase that question to long you know, memory, B-cell and T-cell memory. Right. So I think the immune responses that we see after the booster dose certainly suggest that it's a, it's a multifold increase, almost an eight to tenfold increase compared to after the primary dose, suggesting that there is actually uh, induction of memory responses. Uh, so I don't think antibody on its yeah. own uh, in first absence of immunity. And I think that's what we need to guard against. Uh, because even in terms of natural infection, what we see is that even in, with the waning of antibody, there's persistence in terms of T cell uh, immunity, uh, lo at least looking at early spots. Mm. So I'm not too concerned in terms of the waning of antibody with natural infection. I, we expect that to occur in absence of continuous stimulation. Uh, so we expect that sort of waning to occur. Uh, but I think when it comes to vaccines, it's really the memory responses which are essential. And the early evidence indicates that we are inducing memory responses based on the robustness of the response yeah. to the booster dose. Yeah. Uh, another question is, um, how, how do the, have the Chinese and Russian vaccines been tested in animal, in animal models? So the Russian, the Chinese vaccine, yes, there is an animal model study that's the NHP, a non-human primate study that's been done, but I don't know if it's been done for inactivated vaccines. I might, I, I know it's been done for a chimp ad vaccine, so I'll need, I haven't checked for uh, inactivated vaccines, largely because I'm not a fan of it, but I'm mm. not too sure. I'll need to check that out. Mm. The, the Russian study, unfortunately, there isn't any data published, um, either in non-human primates or in humans, although there's apparently it's been submitted for publication, the human phase one study, uh, it's been sub submitted for publication now, yeah. for review. Uh, and uh, what was the proportion of potential vaccine volunteers that already had SARS-CoV-2 antibodies uh, when tested for eligibility for, for the for the chimp at one vaccine trial? Yeah, so that's been a huge, huge problem. So we started the study in South Africa at the time when we were peaking in terms of the outbreak, including Gauteng. And forget the number of people that were zero positive, uh, we didn't really screen for that initially. Uh, but when we started enrolling, we were testing at the time of enrollment and about 15 to 20 percent of people that were asymptomatic were testing positive for the virus. So you can imagine what the zero positivity would be. So that actually uh, forced us to go into an amendment to actually do a pre-screen to exclude people that are actually positive, that are infected at the time of enrollment. But that means we're still including people that are likely to have been previously infected that are zero positive. But to some extent, that's important because we're also wanting to know how this vaccine works in people that were previously infected. And obviously, if you were to deploy the vaccine uh, as part of an immunization program, you're not going to screen out people on seropositivity and seronegativity. So it's important for the efficacy studies to include the broad spectrum irrespective of their seropositivity status. But we'll obviously be able to analyze for that. Uh, in terms of whether there's any differences in terms of efficacy based on baseline seropositivity status. Right, right. And, and uh, a, a few more questions uh, that are coming through. Uh, given that the uh, HLA and genetic diversity in South Africa might be more heterogeneous than, say, for example, in the UK or Europe, uh, would you expect to see um, different types of immune responses linked to the HLA diversity? Yeah, so that's very much a question that we're wanting to answer. So the, the study is designed to address the issue of HLA diversity and immune response, immunogenicity. Right. And um, I, I think the short answer is we do expect a difference. I think there's yeah. good reason. <laughs> right, right. And in, in connection with 
other coronavirus infections, um, do you know if there has been any correlation with disease severity of SARS-CoV-2 with maybe potential other coronavirus infections and maybe by extension, how that might impact on, on vaccine responses? Yes, I guess the big topic at the moment is how the issue of uh, possible cross-protection, T-cell mm. immunity cross-protection related to the common cold coronaviruses. And uh, so whether that would actually affect immune responses, uh, it might depend on the construct, on the vaccine construct itself, uh, as to whether that might have a dampening effect in terms of immune responses, both in terms of humoral as well as T-cell uh, immunity. But I think that's a really important issue for us to address in South Africa. Uh, I'm of the opinion that that is the reason why this pandemic and outbreak hasn't actually been as severe as had been projected for South Africa. I think that because, like I said, in our vaccine studies, the number of people that were asymptomatic that were testing positive, my suspicion in a place such as Soweto, is that when we do the seroepidemiology study in a few weeks' time, we will show that probably 35 to 40 percent in people of, of people in Soweto have been infected. And the only way to explain why it, why it didn't sort of translate into severe disease and death and overwhelming of healthcare facilities is that there's some underpinning cross-protection because of exposure probably to the common cold coronaviruses. Um, I, I, there's a request here to please put up your last slide because um, there are some people who want to volunteer and they want to know who to contact. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, I can. Uh, and while you're finding that, um, there's another question here about um, trials in older age groups. Um, so I'm presuming greater than 60 or 65. Uh, yeah, so those studies are currently underway uh, in the UK. They're now doing the evaluation at greater than 70 years. So most of the vaccine's uh, efficacy trials are looking at immunovac efficacy up to 65 years of age. But in parallel to that, they're also doing uh, immunogenicity studies in older age groups and high other high-risk groups. So I think we've lost Shabir. Shabir, our, uh, we, uh, we can't no longer hear you. Okay, so there you see uh, the last slide um, for um, volunteering. And I think it will be fantastic that we all volunteer, all 221 of us who are on this webinar today. Mind you, I, I see some people are not in South Africa, but in your own country, you can volunteer. So it's now my great pleasure to, so thank you very much, Shabir. I'm sorry you got cut off uh, prematurely. Um, uh, so it's my great pleasure now to introduce um, Ed Rabitsky. Uh, um, so Ed uh, is Professor of Microbiology and the Director of the Biofarming Research Unit, or BREW, uh, in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology here at the University of Cape Town. His research interests are in vaccine biotechnology and molecular virology, with an emphasis on making high value and pharmaceutically relevant proteins via transient expression in plants. So the brew has currently, uh, has presently has have project on making um, SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins from plants, HIV subunit vaccines, and then investigating plant expression of emerging virus proteins. So um, Ed, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to our webinar today. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. No. If I can ask you maybe to keep your video on so that we can see you uh, while you present, it'd be fantastic. Yeah. Now, I thought I was giving a talk to Clive's Division of Immunology, so imagine my surprise when I find out there's 221 people in a possibly multi-country audience. So you get what you pay for, and it's me talking about COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 alternative vaccine approaches. Now, it's an understatement to say that the coronavirus hit this planet like a major meteor strike. In fact, the IMF early on, this is months ago, already was saying that it's pushed the world, has pushed the world into a recession. It's obviously 
uh, done nothing but get worse since then. And it's it, despite the containment measures and sometimes because of the containment measures put in place. Now, this is the criminal in question. SARS-CoV-2, the people of viral zone, which is an incredibly good resource for those of you who don't know about it, simply repurpose their SARS-CoV diagram because it's more or less exactly the same. It's an enveloped virus, picks up an envelope through budding out of, budding out of cells, um, has an envelope glycoprotein, the S protein, which is a stable trimer, has an M protein embedded all the way through the membrane, there's another one called E or envelope, which also goes through the membrane with much lower concentration. Then a very large amount of N protein, nuclear protein, which forms a helix with a 32 kilobase single strand RNA genome. Now, I'm going to quickly give you an overview of infection just so you can uh, imagine where some of the vulnerability points are. The virus gets into cells by using the S protein to attach to angiotensin converting enzyme, which is the cellular surface receptor. I'll just let that plane fly over. It's a cell surface receptor and ACE2 is very common in the upper respiratory tract, it turns out, but not only. It's actually all over the body and including on the inside of blood vessels, which is part of the problem. Virus gets into the cell via a vesicle, which forms by bending the membrane formation of a plasma cage, interaction of the S protein with the membrane that causes oppression of the virus membrane with the inside of the vesicle, release of the nuclear protein into the cytoplasm, where it's co-translationally disassembled because it's a messenger RNA. Then you get the replication machinery building up in double walled vesicles derived from the endoplasmic reticulum. All of the Glycoproteins being made, um, processed inside the ER, the nuclear protein budding into the ER to form particles, which then get budded out of the ER as exosomes. And you get the reverse process happening as happened with entry in that the exosomes fuse with the cell membrane and release an intact virus particle. Now, if you want to toss spanners in, where should you start? This is the genome here couple of large and a lot of small open reading frames. It gets into cells, it immediately makes proteins with a translational read through over here between ORF1A and ORF1B, which results in a pile of different proteins that get processed by two different proteases. So the big polyproteins get processed into functional units by two proteases. The replication machinery starts with the RDRP which makes full length negative from full length plus, and then messenger RNAs from the full length negative. And these are all of the other open reading frames. Each one only expresses the one, the open reading frame nearest the five prime end of the RNA. Now, if you want to stop the virus working or nucleoside analogs would work, turns out remdesivir, which is, was developed for Ebola, has some efficacy, but not particularly good. Protease inhibitors, people immediately thought by analogy to HIV, that if you use antiretroviral proteinase inhibitors, you could inhibit. It turns out that they don't work particularly well either. Fusion inhibitors, and again analogous with retroviruses, if you can stop that protein, which is exactly the same kind of membrane protein as HIV and influenza, HA for example, um, same as ENV and HA, you can stop that thing fusing because that's its main function after binding to the surface of cells. Then you can stop the virus getting in. Then obviously antibodies directed against the S protein are going to stop the virus getting in in the first place or stop it getting out of the vesicles in the second place. But everybody seems to have forgotten it. it took a long, long time for the Twittersphere to pick up on the fact that cell mediated immunity is really quite important when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 infection, and in fact, all coronaviruses and many other viruses, and that you can get cell-mediated immune responses to a pretty big chunk of the virus proteome. And I'll get back to that a little bit later. 
And then on a complete side, if you want another kind of therapeutic agent, here's a good one touted by the Cape Times for you. So SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, can one become immune and is reinfection possible? The answer is yes and potentially yes. What are the correlates of protection? What needs to be in a vaccine? Well, people have answered this by concentrating or more or less obsessively on the S protein. But as Shabir has pointed out, there's at least one vaccine that includes a nuclear protein as well, because there's good cell mediated responses to N protein. What is the best kind of vaccine? I have my preferences and I'll tell you about some of them. How close are we to getting the vaccine? pretty close and will we get vaccines in South Africa that are not just here to be trialed? This is the burning question and we sincerely hope the government's doing some fairly strong negotiation. So this was an extremely important paper. It's actually a follow-up of another earlier one in Cell by Shane Crotty's group, where they followed up on their earlier observation that there's a pre-existing set of memory CD4 plus T cells that are cross-reactive with comparable affinity to SARS-CoV-2 and common cold coronaviruses. And they looked at all four of them, OC43, 229E, NL63, and HKU1. And borrowing from their earlier paper, if you're infected with SARS-2, you get CD4 and CD8 cells that um, have reactor epitopes derived from the S protein, the M, the N, and a couple of the non-structural proteins, as well as obviously IgG and IgA responses and humoral immunity. CD8 plus T cells in 70% of respondents also react to the same panel of proteins. And then of course, and this is one of these cases where the negative control yields the most interesting results, they found in unexposed people, people with no exposure to SARS-2, that they also had CD4 cells in 50% and CD8 cells in 20% that reacted to many of the same peptides. So S, non-structural and M proteins for um, CD4 and the same panel of, pro of proteins for CD8 plus which gave rise to the fascinating speculation that just maybe recent exposure because immunity to common cold coronaviruses is transient, lasts at best three years. It means that if you've had one or more of these in the last couple of years and they do not cross protect against each other, you may just have some baseline immunity, cellular, cell mediated immunity in terms of memory cells that can kick into life when you get exposed to SARS-2 that could ameliorate the disease. Then, can you get immune? Well, um, Dan Baruch's group, he's famous for doing more or less the same things with HIV for many years now, showed that SARS-2 infection protects against re-challenge in rhesus macaques. You can put SARS-2 into rhesus macaques, you can get high viral loads and upper and lower respiratory tract humoral and cellular immune responses and pathologic evidence of pneumonia, when these animals cleared the virus, they were then re-challenged. They showed five, time, five log 10 reductions in median viral loads, bronchial alveolar lavage and nasal mucosa compared to primary infection. They did make the point that they challenged with a lot of virus and some of this was potentially residual but that almost certainly you could get reinfection, but it most definitely did not lead to disease. So their rather lame conclusion was the protection is mediated by immunologic control, but was not by a sterilizing antibody mediated immunity because they didn't have sterilizing immunity, which therefore uh, implicates cellular responses rather strongly. And Shabir went through this, the vaccine development and I'm taking slides here from Florian Kramer who gave an extremely nice Howard Hughes uh, general webinar about two weeks ago and said I could use some of his slides. That's the standard um, vaccine development timeline from design and exploratory through to large-scale production and distribution around about 15 years. They've compressed the response to SARS-2 
to between 10 months and one and a half years. And they took the lesson here from Ebola, because although some of the Ebola products had been looked at for quite some time, there was only ever preclinical. And rushing those things through to actually putting them into people was the equivalent sort of timeline as you're looking here. So it is possible. Then if you look at vaccine platforms, you have RNA vaccines, DNA, recombinant protein, vectored vaccines, live attenuated and inactivated. The RNA and DNA vaccines, there are no licensed vaccines using these platforms, none. They are um, investigational vaccines that have been used in things like HIV vaccine trials for DNA, uh, Ebola vaccine trials for RNA, but they have not been licensed for human use. And additionally, the technology to actually make billions of doses of these doesn't exist right now. There have to be some massive tooling up to actually make these things. Recombinant proteins, we know about recombinant proteins because of um, vacular virus that's been used for influenza and HPV, yeast expression systems for HPV and HPV, um, and obviously the huge monoclonal antibody um, manufacturing system. So you could do the same kinds of manufacture for recombinant proteins on a, probably a much bigger scale than you could do for RNA and DNA. Um, you've heard a bit about Novavax, I'll say some more now. Vectored vaccines, you don't need as much in terms of material for a vectored vaccine because you grow that thing as if it was wild type virus. This would be modified vaccinia ankara, um, the various adenoviruses, AD5, AD26, and chimpanzee adenovirus, and vesicular stomatitis, and I'll introduce you to a new one at the end. Live attenuated, I think it's a non-starter. People are looking at it, but it typically takes a long time to develop a reliable, safe, live attenuated vaccine. And then Shabir's non-favorite, the inactivated. This is the oldest technology. Make something, kill it, use it as a vaccine. Um, it's a well-established technology. It's pretty straightforward. The only problem with SARS-2 is it's a BSL-3 agent. You have to grow at a huge scale, because this is not infectious, a huge scale, something that is actually pathogenic and then inactivated satisfactorily without spreading it into the surrounding countryside. Now, again, I'll point out that the technologies that are actually licensed for human use are not RNA and DNA, but definitely yes for bacula, for bacula virus and yeast expression for subunits, as well as certain um, mammalian cell production systems. And vectored vaccines, yes for VSV, which was on release for Ebola, but not for the others. But I would correct that in that the AD26 was used as a combination with MDA for Ebola as well. Then my coronavirus vaccine track, as I think about three days more up to date than Shabir's because it does have the two that are approved. But there's 135 plus vaccines not yet in human trials, 20 phase one, 11 in phase two, and eight in phase three, and two approved as of two days ago. The ones that are getting the most hype right now are Moderna, which is a messenger RNA vaccine that's in phase three trial. On, from July 27th, they're looking at enrolling 30,000 people in the States now. BioNTech, which is a German vaccine, which is exactly the same thing effectively, uh, the S protein, simple as that. In a messenger RNA, this is July 27th, they launched a phase two, phase three trial with 30,000 volunteers in the States, Argentina, Brazil, and Germany. The Chadox, the AstraZeneca University of Oxford, and right now the Serum Institute of India is involved because this is a live vaccine, effectively. Um, it's not infectious once you get to humans, but it, you can grow it like a live virus. They've got capacity at the Serum Institute to make over a billion doses a year. So this could be one of the game changers. It's in phase two, three trial in UK, and then trials in Brazil and South Africa as well. They're reckoning they might be able to get emergency vaccines delivered by October. The Wuhan Institute of Biological Products has looked at an inactivated vaccine. And yes, they did test this in animals first. It was safe and it gave a pretty good immune response. 
Abu Dhabi, it's getting 15,000 people about to be injected. Sinopharm in China, which is involved in the Wuhan product, is testing a second inactivated one. This is from the Beijing Institute of Biological Products. United Arab Emirates and I think the Philippines have read somewhere recently. Sinovac Biotech is looking at another inactivated vaccine called Coronavac and phase two, three trials on a small number of people. And they've now got a phase three trial in Brazil. They, they are building a facility to manufacture up to 100 million doses annually, which is going to be too little too late unless you're looking at the very long term. Then Can, CanSino Bio has got approved for limited use because of the uh, hopefully willing participation of the Chinese military. So they did phase two trials, got a good strong immune response from an Adeno5 Adeno based vaccine and then tested it in the Chinese military and approved it very speedily. And the Saudi ministry announced that they would be running phase three trials in Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't like the sound of Adeno5 because especially in Africa, there's, much, there's way higher seroprevalence, uh, sero seropositivity to Ad5 than there is in the rest of the world. So it's going to possibly be essentially useless here. Then the Sputnik V, the Gamaleya Research Institute in Russia launched something that they called GamCovid VacLayer, which got renamed Sputnik V and got tested in the Russian military, again, hopefully willingly, and has been licensed already, despite the fact that it effectively was only in phase one. Now, there's a lot being written about this. There's a thousand people going to say, we told you so if this thing fails. On the other hand, there's going to be an undignified scramble to get it if it turns out it works. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Now, Florian pointed out some data on the Novavax um, COV-2373, the one, same one that Shabia talked about testing here. They've got data on various dosages using the matrix um, adjuvant. Point is that this actually makes nanoparticles. It's really rather nice. The pictures that came up in this paper that I've highlighted in the bottom left here show really beautiful rosettes so they can multimerize um, intact, because it's got the transmembrane domain on it, intact S protein. They can get it forming really neat looking particles that are considerably bigger than subunit alone. And the advantage of this is it's self adjuvanting and it stimulates um, cellular responses as well as antibody responses because of the particulate nature. So I'm, I would get vaccinated with this thing in a shot. Then if you look at the relative results between the different vaccines, look at Novavax, after a boost, you're getting in the one to 3,000 neutralizing antibody titer. You're not just talking antibodies here, you talk about neutralizing antibodies. Moderna, after a boost, gave one to 300 or so. The BNT162, which is also an mRNA, about one in 250, AstraZeneca, um, Chadox, one in 20 to one in 250 after boost. So again, not particularly immunogenic in the terms of making neutralizing antibodies. However, the particulate protein subunit looks to be really, really good. Now I remind you here that the natural immunity to human papillomaviruses, for example, people have lousy antibody titers, yet they obviously recover from it. Whereas the vaccine regime, whether, whether in fact you use only one or you use all three recommended vaccinations, you get incredibly high antibody titers. So there's a possibility of getting much better immune responses from vaccines than you do from natural infection. And we ought to actually look to this to be a result out of vaccines for COVID. And I mentioned this because Florian Kramer was too uh, reticent to actually blow his own trumpet in his own seminar, but they've got a bioarchive manuscript up on Newcastle disease virus, expressing the spike protein of SARS-2 as a vaccine candidate. This comes out of Peter Polizzi's lab, so this isn't a bunch of, you know, uh, random no-hopers just pumping something out. The point of using Newcastle 
would be that unlike a lot of other viral vectors, and okay, Chadox might be different here, but um, MVA, ADD26, and ADD5, and VSV for that matter, all have the possibility that humans have been exposed to them. And unlike that, the NDV, and this has been used for gene therapy, or sorry, uh, cancer therapy as a lytic agent, people would not have encountered it and therefore there would be no vector immunity. And it's extremely cost effective to make these things for large scale manufacture because you can make them under BSL-2 conditions using flu vaccine technology, AKA eggs. And the worldwide capacity for making egg-based vaccines is around 1.3 billion doses installed capacity. So if you could do that for a vaccine like this, this could actually be rather useful. Then the real outsider, the alternative, plant-made virus-like particle vaccine, which I know nobody is talking about except the people themselves and people like Merck and uh, GSK, because Medicago Incorporated, which is the biggest uh, biotech in Canada, who I, and here's my disclosure, they've actually funded us to do quite a lot of work and they've licensed a few of our patents. Medicago announced that they had a vaccine candidate very early on, in fact. They showed that they got a positive antibody response 10 days after a single dose in mice. They made that thing, I think, a record. Somebody claimed a record that they went from 26 days from sequence to vaccine, and that might have been Moderna. These guys did it in about 15 took sequence off the databases and they had stuff in vials about 15 days later. And they've gone to phase one clinical trials already as of July 14th. So their results actually should be coming out pretty soon. And point is that they can use pretty low doses between three and a bit and 15 micrograms. They've, it's based on exactly the same technology as their seasonal influenza virus vaccine, which should be actually getting licensed around about now if COVID hadn't happened, because they've actually got, the, um, got a candidate out, tested, been through phase three trial, and looks extremely good. They make virus-like particles using the simple property of proteins like S and influenza hemagglutinin, that if you express these things in plants, one, you can get large amounts of protein. Two, these things bud. They bud out of normal plant cells, just as a single protein with interacting with the cell membrane. Whereas in mammalian cells, you actually need more than one protein to do that. In plant cells, you do not. So they basically have, they can make 100 nanometer virus-like particles that are very densely studded with uh, enveloped glycoproteins. This depicts flu, but you can use exactly the same thing. And in fact, they have a patent for coronavirus S proteins as well. So I'll, I'll be watching that with huge interest. They've also teamed up with GSK and Merck using two, diff two different adjuvants to see if they can get really good responses. Then Clive mentioned that we actually had a go at making vaccines. Manny Margolin in mine and Annalise Williamson's group very early on, this is February, had already made protein in both mammalian cells and plants. This is a soluble version we, like many, many other people, pivoted what we already were already doing. And what we were already doing is making HIV envelope protein as soluble GP140 in both plants and mammalian cells at high, um, at high yield and antigenically appropriate to be used as a vaccine. He just pivoted what he was doing with GP140 into making S protein, exact analog, um, in Nicotiana benthamiana, and obviously we applied for money to make vaccine, and three months later the South African government told us that they weren't funding vaccines to be made in South Africa. Which is a pity because we'd used technology that we'd actually applied for a patent for. If you look at this western blot down on the bottom here, on the left, that vague, vague band there is what happens if you do not co-express human calreticulin with the protein of interest, the band that I point at now is what happens when you do express calreticulin. It hugely amplifies production of protein in plants. And we also getting, if you co-express furin, you're getting the furin cleavage of the S protein so that it looks exactly like what the 
uh, body would encounter in a natural infection. The company, we spun out a company a little while back, it's now completely independent, called Cape Biofarms, sitting on the edge of Pinelands, about 800 meters away from me right now. These guys also jumped the bandwagon really early and made S1 protein attached to various partners, including uh, human IgG1 uh, heavy chain, rabbit IgG heavy chain, and others, and as well as fusing it to enzymes, and is already selling this as a reagent. They can make sufficient of it in plants. They're selling it as a reagent right now to put into test kits. And Wendy Berger's group from um, UCT's ID, IDM has already tested that protein made in plants in the assay that they derived from what Florian Kramer published early on with the plasmids that he sent out to the whole world to make S protein, as well as his control antibodies, um, and showed that the plant-made protein behaves exactly the same way as mammalian cell-made protein. So in other words, it's a very viable replacement. The beauty of this is that mammalian cell culture costs up to a thousand times more to make the same amount of biomass as it does to use plants. And if you're getting high yields out of plants, the cost saving is absolutely incredible. So I'll conclude there. This is thanks to my ex-student and colleague Ziad Vali Omar, who had a beautiful conclusion slide, which has a Balrog, but it also has uh, Gandalf, who says, I wish it need not have happened in my, sorry, Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But it is not for them to decide. <laughs> all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And in our case, it's apply for money and try and make COVID vaccine. So with that, I give you my favorite gift and thank you. Um, thank you so much, Andrew Vitsky. Um, unfortunately, due to load shedding, Clive um, is not av available to ask the questions, so I'll do it on his behalf. So a lot of these questions follow up from Shabir Mahdi's talk, but um, I'll just ask them. So one of the questions is, are there any discussions taking place regarding the ethical rollout of successful vaccines? Are lower income countries participating in clinical, vaccine, clinical fa phases of these vaccines given the equal access to production as the country that is developing the Vaccine. What was that first question again? I'm old, I can't remember more than one Sorry. at a time. Are there discussions on the ethical rollout of the vaccines? Yes, most certainly there are discussions. How far they get depends on who's doing the discussing and at what level. Now, the problem of what happens in Africa specifically and with SARS-CoV, uh, Manny, Manny Margol and, and a bunch of people, including Mark Mendelssohn and I think Rob Wilkinson is a co-author on this, is about to be published in Nature Microbiology Reviews. There is essentially no vaccine production in Africa at all for COVID, none, nothing. There's also essentially no capacity and certainly not to do it at the sort of scale that we would need. As for whether people are negotiating access, well, Shabir might be able to tell you more than I can because he's actually doing the trials and I'm sure that they're in touch with the manufacturers. One sincerely hopes, and Oxford apparently has been very ethical about this, saying they don't want to make money out of it. One hopes that those discussions are happening and that they're licensing these things as fast as they can. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, is would the pre-existing immunity against SARS-2 arising from other COVID-2? Yeah, that question is. Basically, the question is asking, are people who have mild disease um, likely to have pre-existing immunity to other coronaviruses, and that's why they have mild disease? That's the speculation. It's, look, some of it's genetic, some of it turns out to actually be dose. If you get a large dose you're apparently more likely to develop severe disease than somebody who gets a smaller dose. Um, been shown in experimental animals, for example. But as for does it protect, because there's always that specter of antibody-dependent enhancement, for example, 
although the S protein does not cross-react antigenically with the human other human coronaviruses. So you're looking at cell-mediated responses, and that you don't get ADE really with the cell-mediated responses. So one would sincerely hope that pre-exposure, recent pre-exposure to one of the seasonal common cold um, coronaviruses could actually be partially protected. And I, in, I'm sure we'll know in the next couple of months. Okay, um, the next question is, do you think that plant-based vaccines will be more successful than traditional vaccine development methods? Oh, without a doubt. Ah, I am very biased uh, in that's what my group does. Look, plant-based vaccines, basically they're going to be subunit vaccines. You can make protein in terms of biomass a heck of a lot cheaper in plants and much more safely because there's no chance of contamination with things like um, oncogenic viruses or oncogenes for that matter um, with plants. The problem is getting buy-in from big pharma and getting the size of the plants to do the sort of thing increased. The Ebola um, antibody, antibodies that were trialed, eventually they, they were made in plants to start with. People started looking at using uh, monoclonal antibody plants using mammalian cells, using Cho cells, for the simple reason that they had bigger installed capacity than exists for plant manufacture. So basically what we need is more plant manufacture, which could knock the price down of things like other biologics. So that's protein-based vaccines, antibodies, and other th therapeutics down much, much lower than they are now. Okay, um, another question is, do you think an effective vaccine can be successfully developed in one and a half years? And the follow-up to that, um, are there any vaccines that is currently being done on pregnant women or in individuals with other, with comorbidities? Shabir will answer the one on pregnant women because he's done some really nice work on flu vaccine in that. But can you knock out a vaccine in one and a half years? Effectively, that's what they did with Ebola. Okay, and here we've got exactly the same advantage as they had with Ebola, in that people simply pivoted what they were doing for Ebola or for SARS, the original SARS, into SARS-2. So they had platforms, they had very similar proteins, they simply pivoted what they were doing to put the SARS proteins in. They did exactly the same thing for Ebola. Um, they had experimental platforms up and running, investigational vaccines that had some preclinical data. Getting from that point into humans is the bottleneck and the long drawn out. If you can do it quicker, and you obviously can, they did it with Ebola, and they're doing it again right now with SARS-2. Why can't we carry on doing that? Um, the next question is, do you think lockdown will um, have any confounding effects on the efficacy, potential efficacy measured in any of the vaccines? Yes. I I'm locked down sufficiently that nobody gets to me except within about a five meter radius um, without being threatened with sharp objects. So, yes, I would not be a particularly good person for an efficacy trial because I make damn sure that I'm not exposed. But given that people are getting uh, exposed despite lockdown, then obviously there is a population that is susceptible. Okay. Um, another question, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, but um, are you able to comment on the susceptibility of SARS-CoV-2 with regards to blood groups in the context no. of South Africa? <laughs> Um, Shabir, I've, heard, I've heard that there is some effect. I have not read enough about it, and I don't think it's been looked at in enough detail. Okay. Um, if Shabir is able to answer that. Yeah, I'm so just quickly going backtracking one. So in terms of the pregnant women, those studies are currently being planned, but they're unlikely to occur before we get efficacy data. And those will be immunogenicity safety studies. Uh, I mean, in terms of the blood groups, there was some consideration that blood group A plus uh, is associated with more severe disease, but it hasn't been studied in a South African context. Okay, thank you very much. And there's a question on any chance of having um, consumable <laughs> vaccines. 
eatable vaccines. Yes. yes, yes, there is. There's a wonderful young Canadian person developing exactly such a thing with advice, with interested advice from us presently. Um, the point there is the original plant-based vaccines are all supposed to be edible and you could grow bananas and vaccinate yourself and completely and utterly impractical. But the concept of having uh, killed edible or oral vaccines, make it oral rather than edible, is very, very real. And there's a lot of work being done on looking at um, immunogenicity using things like, and my brain goes completely dead, there's some adjuvants that work extremely well when you put it in via the oral route. CPG is one of them, by the way. That um, it is feasible and it would be cheaper than any other uh, means of vaccination. The problem is that the doses are a lot larger than if, you, you, if you're doing things by injection. So you'd have to be able to make very large amounts of protein cheaply. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, um, do you think that the vaccine will have will be broadly efficacious in terms of different um, geographies and different places and also in terms of against different variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus? There's a lot of nonsense being talked about how mutable RNA viruses are and how this thing is mutating and how there's a new strain that does this, that and the other. It's mostly garbage for the simple reason that this virus exploded out of China, well, we assume out of China so quickly and from such a small point of origin that all of the isolates of the virus are effectively identical. They're, they're exactly the same down to 0.005%, for example. People say there's 100 nucleotides, the thing is 32 kilobases long. 100 nucleotides is nothing. It mutates much slower than influenza virus does, for example. And flu takes a couple of years to be able to escape um, immune responses, and then not completely. This thing mutates a whole lot slower than that. So the chances that there are A, more strains that it will escape immunity, and B, that it will vary fast enough to get away from pre-existing immune responses are essentially no. There's other RNA viruses like hepatitis A, which there's only, well, measles for that matter. There's really only one serotype of each of them. Okay. Um, thank you very much, um, Ed and Shabir, for presenting your talks during the webinar and also the attendees for um, attending the webinar. Our next webinar will be on the 4th of September sorry, on the 1st of September, and it will be on BCG and COVID-19. Um, thank you. And thank you all, and Shabir, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Likewise, yeah, thanks. Looking forward to getting some tobacco leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, Korea. <laughs>